rights. However, they do not give us a lot of other rights. Consider freedom of religion. Well, what's that got to do with keeping democracy working? Nothing. Right? I mean, there's nothing in principle that says that the majority couldn't uh, have um, uh, decide that everybody was going to be Roman Catholic or uh, perhaps um, Anglican, as in Great Britain, and so on. Uh, freedom of speech. Consider all the restrictions on freedom of speech that have been voted for in a democratic community. Lots and lots of them, all the time. Uh, lifestyle. Well, take the laws against drugs. Perfect example of a very severe restriction on lifestyle um, based on something other than uh, just the libertarian requirement that people do it without imposing uh, restrictions on others, uh, and so on. All these things are things which, uh, in principle, there's no reason why a majority couldn't abridge if it felt like it, and again, I had, as, as they often uh, do. Paul, next one. So, uh, yes, I've gotten ahead of myself, but in all these things uh, are, are illustrations of what you can do with a majority. Of course, Hitler's getting into power was an example of getting into power and uh, uh, then abandoning democracy altogether, showing the need for uh, construing democracy in stronger terms than, uh, than that. Okay, next. Now, <clears throat> among the re various restrictions on democracy that have uh, constitutions <laughs> such as the American Bill of Rights and the Canadian Charter, um, of rights and liberties of God. They are, they are mostly the ones that I've listed so far. However, if we look at the archetypal theorist uh, of liberalism, John Locke, um, <clears throat> he imposes, he, he suggests three basic restrictions on what uh, the legislative power can do. Uh, the most interesting one from our point of view is the third one. The first two have to do with arbitrary rules, and we can accept all that. But the third one is that the supreme power cannot take from any man any part of his property without his own consent. Now, when I call that a corker, <laughs> what I mean is, <clears throat> if you can't do that, you can't tax. And if you can't tax, you don't have government. Yeah. Government without taxes is uh, essentially a contradiction in terms. Uh, taxes are necessarily not voluntary. So they're necessarily extracted from people without their specific consent. Of course, people say, well, but we do consent, meaning by this that the majority votes in favor of them. But that doesn't mean that each individual person who is parted from his money is so voluntarily. Quite the contrary. It's quite the reverse of that. So those who say, well, you know, a democracy makes taxation voluntary are using the term in that collective sense, which is, of course, uh, illegitimate. So, since those are necessary to the existence of government, if we took Locke's restriction seriously, we wouldn't have government. If we don't take it seriously, though, what have we got? Paul, next slide. Uh, well, if we ask, well, why shouldn't our income be takeable with that? I mean, why shouldn't we have a, uh, uh, a right to property? Uh, right? Why should we have a right to property? I mean, why, why shouldn't uh, the government be able to just take it? Is well, we could say because it's ours. Now, there's lots of people who would want to say, well, that is the reason. And there's a sense in which that's true. But, of course, the trouble is that uh, ours is a normative term, and it needs explanation. Why is it ours? Why should we say that a person's property is that person's, uh, and uh, other people shouldn't be able to get their hands on it? Um, one way to answer that, roughly, is to say, well, but because it's us. I mean. When you take our property, what you do is to take part of your life. You take part of your activity. You've uh, invested your time and effort in this thing in order to create it, and then somebody takes it away from you. How can you possibly think that that's perfectly OK? Well, it's pretty difficult to think it's perfectly OK. We talk about making a living because that's exactly what we do. We make our living. We work in order to live, live the way we want to do. <clears throat> so, uh, try keeping what you, <clears throat> what you make and deciding yourself what's to be done with it. That's what we libertarians think that uh, it is, and roughly speaking, all about. 
And indeed, Locke went on to say after that very passage, how could you possibly think that there was any point in government if it didn't protect your property rights? That's what government is for. Well, <laughs> right. Next slide. Now, um, we need to talk here a little bit about society. Because when people defend democracy, they often do so in, in fact, the kind of terms that Locke himself went on to do and say, well, look, uh, you know, there's got to be a de decision mechanism for a group if you're going to have, if you're going to have government. Uh, and will necessarily it'll be the majority because that's the greater part of the group in question. Well, let's think about that for a minute. So here's society. And what is society? Well, basically, a whole lot of people interacting. I mean, the term society, of course, can be used in narrower and more special ways, um, sort of capital S ways. But when we're just talking about society, the whole point, we've got all these people and they bump into each other. They interact. Now, what society isn't, that is to say, isn't necessarily is a great big family, either a happy or an unhappy family. It isn't a family at all. It's just a whole bunch of people. <coughs> And another thing it isn't is a great big association. It's not a church, for example, or even a business, or a sports club, or even a show, nothing like that. It's just all these people. <clears throat> and another thing that society is not is a society of equals in any very interesting sense of that term. People are different, and they differ in all sorts of respects, some of which uh, they regard as important and uh, valuable. Some people are a hell of a lot better than others at a whole lot of things that people find interesting and important, like the ability to play the violin, or to play hockey, or etc., 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 without end. People are not equals. And if you found society on the assumption that they are, then you will be founding it on a falsehood. So, given that we've got all these people who differ from each other in all sorts of ways, how do we make social decisions? Well, the most plausible answer to this is that, in a sense, we don't. We don't need social de decisions in one sense of the term. It's a bunch of diverse people needing to make some decisions. Uh, we bump into each other, and a bunch, bunch of the people we bump into, we get together, and we form an association, and we make some decisions for them, and other associations make other decisions, and so on. And the question is, do we need any decision in, in an overall kind of sense? Well, actually, we do. I mean, we need this kind of thing that's referred to as morals. We want to know what's the fundamental, as it were, constitutional restriction on membership in society. Libertarians, as I said uh, this morning, have an answer to that question. The libertarian principle is uh, what we propose as being the fundamental principle of society. And it says, simply, let people do what they want, want, as long as what they want is compatible with other people doing what they want. Um, <clears throat> uh, and that's all we need. Now, almost everybody thinks that we need more than that. Paul, next slide. Uh, ideally, of course, when we interact with others, we would interact for mutual benefit. Now, I mean, I'm suggesting the following. If we ask, you know, here we've got all these people. Let's look at and from the point of view of any one of them and ask, well, what do we want from society? And the short answer would be, well, to be a person is to have a bunch of interests or values, to use the higher falutin term for it. And we ourselves have each got a bunch of powers which we can exert in various directions. And in general, uh, what we are doing is exerting our powers with a view to maximizing our uh, uh, satisfaction of our interests, our achievement of our uh, interests and ideals, uh, whatever they are. Now, uh, <coughs> the thought then is that we each want as much as possible out of each other, and we each want as little trouble from others as possible. That is, we, what we want is minimum damage to our lives from others and maximum benefit. So when we interact, we interact for mutual benefit. When you and I make an agreement which imposes some kind of a restriction on what we do. We do so in the interest of an overall benefit to ourselves, as Hobbes and Locke and so forth noted. And of course, the benefit isn't going to be mutual if some people can simply take from each other's incomes and activities without even asking. Even in a family, that's not quite on. So mutual benefit is a matter of each party doing better in terms of his or her personal values. Notice. 
the importance here of my distinction between what I call liberalism and conservatism this morning. The conservative says, we're going to make you better off, even though you don't think you're better off, but you really are better off, right? Uh, the liberal says, uh-uh. We're going to deal with each, other, with each other as we are, with the values that we have, not the values that, that somebody else thinks we should have. And it's mutual benefit in that sense that society should be aiming at. That indeed is the logical way for people in communities to run their lives, namely by peaceable agreement, instead of by continual invasion of their lives and properties by supposedly well-meaning rulers. Next slide. <clears throat> well, right. Well, as I pointed out, if all interactions are entirely voluntary, we would have no government. And maybe that would be a good thing. Indeed, some people, like uh, Walter and myself, think that it would be a good thing, that anarchy is indeed fundamentally, ultimately, the way to go. Uh, some people think not. And if not, why not? Well, there is only one respectable answer in the business that I know of. And that is because they think that there are public amenities and services they would be both hard to have without government and things that we actually want, things that actually would be beneficial. Obviously, there are lots and lots of good things we can have without government. For example, food. And notoriously, and historically, when government gets into the food business, it's in general for the worse. The absolutely supreme classic example being Maoist China, whose agricultural uh, idiocies led to the starvation of something like 35 million people back in the early 60s. Um, <clears throat> whereas letting people grow their own food and charge money for it is the way to make sure that everybody has enough to eat. And the same thing applies to entertainment, houses, cars, there's all sorts of things. <clears throat> what about roads? Well, more difficult, not actually impossible, but at least a plausible example of something where maybe we could use something like government, maybe. So the question is, when, if ever, should democracy apply? Um, Paul? Uh, 